Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. I hope it's not all loud static like it was before. We were having a couple of technical issues with the sound. Uh, as you can see, I don't have headphones on today, so I can't hear what's playing or what volume is going out, and that's because they would have been sh for show, because at the moment I can send the sound either to stream or to my ears. Can't do both. So anyway, <laughs> hopefully all is good. Uh, Hannah says it's good on the VTUL Studios channel, and Key Squared says it's good over on Rogan27. And also, Rykar01, thank you so much for your six-month resubscription on the Rogan27 channel. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, I do need to get this show on the road, uh, so I'm going to read the opening stuff that I do every show, because uh, I think it is very, very important, um, but I have a terrible memory for what I'm going to say, and I want to make sure I actually say all of the words. So, <laughs> uh, I acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live here at Virginia Tech and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. Uh, I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undi in undeniably tied to that legacy. Uh, further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So. Thank you for uh, <laughs> hanging around and, and letting me every week uh, give those acknowledgments. I think it is very important to acknowledge um, that this land was originally native land and was taken from the natives, um, from the native people. Uh, and I think it's also very important to acknowledge the history of slavery in the United States, especially with this coming uh, coming Saturday being Juneteenth, which is a day that acknowledges the end of chattel slavery in the United States. And I do kind of quotes because the end, uh, yes and no, it, it acknowledges it because two years after the Civil War, the message that slavery had ended two years previous was finally delivered to enslaved persons in Texas. And that is what Juneteenth commemorates, is the delivery of that message, uh, finally telling people in Texas that they had been free for two years, even though for those two years they had not been free. Um, anyway, <laughs> it's a very important um, day to acknowledge. It is. Uh, a good thing that it's getting a lot of attention. Um, I know that our government is starting to move towards making it a national holiday, um, but it is important to pay attention to the purpose behind Juneteenth, which is that acknowledgement of the final delivery of that message, which is a thing to celebrate, but also the acknowledgement that it took two years to get there. So, um, but, that's not the focus of today's program. Today we are continuing with our bird stuff. So, uh, what I have for you all today is an item from our collections called Correspondence Concerning the Extermination of the Passenger Pigeon. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it will take two hours for us to go through the correspondence. It is a rather small amount of correspondence, but I have some other items that we can look at if it does end up taking longer than the two, or 
if this doesn't end up taking up the full two hours, I have more bird-related things for us to look at. So, <laughs> that is, oh, sorry, I shouldn't do that. Uh, I cracked my knuckles and I apologize for that. Um, yeah, anyway, <laughs> as always, if you have questions, if there are problems with stream, do let me know. Um, if the captions aren't working properly or if uh, the sound goes out like it did last week, um, just pop a note in chat, let me know what's going on and I will do my best to uh, solve it. If any major global happenings happen during stream, please let me know. <laughs> um, active things that I should know about. Uh, back at when we started the stream, major things were happening in DC and I didn't know until after the stream was over. <laughs> oh, Hannah. <laughs> You can see my, um, my mask. Yes, I do still have it with me. I do still use it uh, when I'm around a bunch of people. And indeed, it is a critical role mask. Uh, <laughs> it, and one of the better masks that I have. Um, and as you can see, I'm very geeked out today in Pride stuff. I have the D&D uh, &D Pride shirt. Um, and then I've got my... Uh, my Star Trek pride badge, because um, why not? <laughs> yeah, the green screen kind of tries to protect the mask. That's a thing. Anyway, I'm going to switch us to the document cam. Um, I think I've done everything properly. I don't know where we're at. I don't know how the camera is oriented today. I was focusing on sound issues and not solving other issues. Um, right. So this is the folder. Passenger Pigeon Correspondence. Um, oh, and, <laughs> and we're getting a raid. So we, we haven't gone that far in. Let me say hello to the Raiders and then we'll, we'll pop back into the um, stuff. Hello everybody, welcome to the Raiders from 16-Bit Eric. Um, thank you, Eric, for bringing the whimsies over to me. It is always wonderful to have you pop by on Wednesdays when I'm doing my archives stream. Um, for anyone new, uh, my name is Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I am the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. If you're on Twitch, you may know me as Rogan27, which is the channel that uh, Eric just raided. Um, <coughs> I uh, am an archivist, as I said, here at Virginia Tech, and once a week I do a show showing off items from our collections um, in Special Collections and University Archives. This month, what I've been showing off is related to ornithology and oology, which is the study of birds and the study of egg-laying creatures, but oology tends to often be associated more with the study of eggs themselves. Um, so <laughs> anyway, welcome in, hang out for a bit. It's usually pretty chill. We do about two hours and then we usually end up raiding over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, but we'll see who we go to today. And DJ Phoenix, Yes, I love the new, the little Star Trek rainbow badge that I got. I was just mentioning that I'm all, all decked out in geeky stuff. Um, so a as I said, this month we are doing, um, sorry, I lost my sentence in the middle of it. We are doing <laughs> ornithology stuff this month. <laughs> wow. Um, and what that means for today is that I am looking at, um, I'm looking at a collection today called the Passenger Pigeon Correspondence. It is from 1945. Uh, it is a collection of materials that were gathered by one of the former head librarians here at Virginia Tech. Um, and we can take a look at the finding aid, it'll give a little bit of history on it, and then we'll take a look at the stuff. So um, I'm not sure it'll take the full two hours. If we finish with the passenger pigeon correspondence before the end of the two hours, 
I have some rare books uh, about birds that we will jump back into. Um, we were looking at some last week. I pulled a few more. Um, I've got one that's like the birds of California. So um, yeah, it should be a good time. If you have any questions about archival work, um, special collections, things like that, let me know uh, because I can try to answer them. Um, right now I'm trying to figure out why this camera is giving me I guess that will work. I could do full pages if I go this way, I think. But then it's sideways, so I'm not gonna do that. Anyway, <laughs> um, this is the, the item we're looking at today. Uh, as you can see, this collection of correspondence has been bound. Uh, it's got a library binding that was put on it, um, and it looks like it was actually a cataloged part of our collection at one point. Um, and so the title that's been added to it is Correspondence Concerning the Extermination of the Passenger Pigeon. It's dated 1945. Just gonna zoom in to try and get the width of the book. Um, I do want to pull up the finding aid for you um, so that we can get a little bit of background on what this is. Um, we have it because uh, we support science research here and um, it was created also by one of our former head librarians. So that's two different reasons why we would have it. Um, let me pop over to the screen share for you. Um, this is the finding aid. It is on a site called Virginia Heritage. Uh, and as you can see, this item was processed by, by Andrea Ledesma, uh, who was one of our student employees, and Kira Dietz, who is an archivist here at Special Collections. Um, and in the abstract, consists of Ralph Brown's 1945 compilation of correspondence on passenger pigeons. Um, gives some information about how to cite it if you're going to. Uh, Ralph Brown, or uh, Ralph M. Brown, uh, born 1848 and died 1958, was a Virginia Tech head librarian, amateur historian, and natu naturalist. Um, so scope and content, which will give an overview of the collection and what's in it. And since this is a small one, it should be relatively short. Uh, it consists of Ralph Brown's 1945 compilation of correspondence on passenger pigeons. Brown was a VPI. Um, VPI is an abbreviation for the former name of Virginia Tech, uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Um, now we're VPI and SU, uh, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, but we do business as and are more commonly known as Virginia Tech. Brown was a VPI librarian working under the request of a professor A.L. Dean of the Agricultural Extension Division. Uh, the latter had made inquiries to ornithologists regarding the possibility that the extermination of the passenger pigeon was caused by disease. Um, all of the ornithologists contacted disagreed with that hypothesis uh, and marked or noted market hunting as the end of the reason for the end of the passenger pigeon. Um, <laughs> so I'm not gonna, they've got some quotes from some of the correspondence in the scope and content. Um, we will look at those. Uh, Brown, the librarian, sent the compilation upon completion to Dr. Merle of the University of Florida. Um, So I don't see in here why, but maybe we will understand that after we look at the items. Because um, I don't see anything in the finding aid that tells me why he sent it there. Is that right, DJ Phoenix? 110 years old? 
Um, also, I didn't mean to show you all the back end, but you got the back end Twitch view because I forgot to switch screen views. Um, 1848 to 1958. Yeah, 110 years. Um, all right, let me switch back to the document focus and then switch my computer screen back so that I can see chat. That's the correct order of operations. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and what's interesting, I don't know the dates that he was the head librarian here, um, but this correspondence is from 1945, so he would have been late 80s? at the time that this correspondence was, was being sent, done? The time of this correspondence? Um, so it is an item that was bound and added to the collection, the library collection. I need to change the camera just a bit because um, I'm going to need to be able to show off both sides, I think. That should work. OK. Um, <laughs> wait, he was 97 in 1945? I don't do math in my head very well. So I knew he was old. 97? Yeah, I guess that would make sense. 97 when this correspondence was, was published or bound. I don't know. We'll, we'll see the dates on the correspondence itself. But as an old library item, you can see we have the little actual, like, the pocket for the date due slip um, with the uh, typed on title and call number. There is actually a slip that was archived with the item. Uh, Somebody checked it out, and it was marked as due March 3rd, 1977. Um, and so when it, when it was added to our archival collections, uh, that was retained. Like, as a library item, there's no reason for us to get rid of that, and it gives us a little bit of a glimpse into library operations of the past, so why not keep it? Um, as you can see, there's also a date due slip on here. Um, it's been stamped once. <coughs> and it appears to say April 27th, 1955. Um, so I'm not sure... I'm not certain how much this item actually circulated. Um, uh, that term, if you're unfamiliar with libraries, circulation refers to the... Um, item being checked out and then coming back in. Um, anytime it is checked out, um, that would count. Like if we were tracking the amount of circulation for a specific item, uh, a single checkout would count as one on a, a count of how much an item is circulating. Um, I don't know if this is going to help or not. I don't think it's going to. There, that helps a little bit. I have a little weighted rope <laughs> that I'm using to help me um, hold the item open. Although I'm not certain it's going to really help. But we'll give it a go. Uh, let me see if I bump that up a little bit and angle this down. There, that's not bad. Uh, so the first one in here is from February 6th, 1945. Um, and what we have here, this appears to be the cover letter of the compi compilation. Uh, as was noted in the finding aid, at the end of the correspondence, <coughs> Ralph Brown sent this all to Dr. W.A. Merle at the University of Florida. And so this appears to be the cover letter that accompanied this um, information when it was sent to Florida. 
Uh, so we have, Dear Dr. Merle, as I wrote you in an earlier letter, M Mr. A. L. Dean of the VPI Agricultural Extension Division volunteered to make inquiry of some ornithologists of his acquaintance on the subject of the possibility that the extermination of the passenger pigeon was caused by disease. He has received replies to his re Sorry, he has received replies to his inquiries, and I am enclosing a copy of the portions of these replies which dealt with the pigeon. I am afraid the results will not help you greatly. Very truly yours, Ralph M. Brown, Librarian. And I'm sitting here, and my phone is just buzz, buzz, buzzing in my pocket, so just checking to make sure that there were no emergencies. And there weren't, so we're good. Um, so I guess A.L. Dean was inquiring after this on behalf of Dr. Merle. Uh, that's what this letter implies. You can see the paper that this is on is very yellow. <clears throat> and it's even, uh, as you can see, there are some, some tears in the pages. Um, this type of paper would be a, a, this would be a case where I definitely just want to use my clean bare hands um, and not use the white gloves that are so often associated with archives in the media. And that's because these pages are really delicate and um, the gloves reduce manual dexterity and could actually catch on the frayed or torn edges of the pages um, and actually cause me to tear the pages where with my bare hands I have better control. Um, yeah, these are really delicate pages. Um, so, <clears throat> which tells me that this is just really acidic paper that these were written on or typed on. Just back up for a second and take a sip of water. And again, as we go, if you have any questions about <coughs> archival processes, if you have comments about the content of what we're reading or questions about the topic, I'm not an expert on ornithology. I do enjoy ornithology. Um, <coughs> I'm not an expert on many things, but I'm always happy to try and find an answer. Um, that's kind of the job of a librarian. So, um, so what we have here is, it appears to be the typed up summary <coughs> of the correspondence. So reply of Dr. S. C. Bishop, University of Rochester, for a fairly recent summary of information about the possible causes concerned with the di disappearance of the passenger pigeon, see Life Histories of North American Gallinaceous Birds by Arthur Cleveland Bent in U.S. National Museum, Volume 162, 379 to 402, 1932. Here you will find numerous references which will lead you to additional papers. So far as I am concerned, there is no particular mystery about the disappearance of the passenger pigeon. It was slaughtered by the millions, and when a, when a gregarious species is reduced to very limited numbers, any unusual conditions might well wipe out the remnants. <coughs> so is everybody familiar with what passenger pigeons are? Um, if you're not, I can certainly bring up some information about passenger pigeons. Um, there's a lovely page. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to drop a link in chat uh, to an Audubon Society uh, item from 2014 about the passenger pigeon. Um, and if, let's see. I 
just need to grab it on both computers, because I have one stream on one computer and one stream on the other computer. So there we go. <coughs> uh, so if you want to take a look at that page, um, it's an article from the Audubon Society called Why the Passenger Pigeon Went Extinct and Whether It Can and Should Be Brought Back to Life a Century After It Disappeared. Um, it includes a couple of photographs of passenger pigeons, but also uh, the Audubon Society would be a place where you could probably find additional images of passenger pigeons. Otherwise, um, you know, just a general Google image search should turn up uh, a decent selection of images of passenger pigeons. There's a Scientific American article that you can get to pretty quickly about what happened to the passenger pigeon. Um, so if you want to see specimens um, <coughs> or learn more about what happened to passenger pigeons, resources are out there. But if you need help finding them, do let me know. I'm going to continue reading this correspondence. Uh, we have a reply from John T. Zimmer, Curator, Department of Birds, American Museum of Natural History, New York City. Dr. Chapman has asked me to reply to your letter of January 17 regarding the passenger pigeon. There are, frequently, attempts by various people to find some reasons for the disappearance of this bird other than the accepted one of market hunting. So far as I know, there has never been any evidence of disease having been prevalent in this species. There is unquestioned evidence of their destruction by market hunters, and when a species reaches a certain low point in numbers, which point may differ in different species, its end is certain. Certainly, at the time the bird was extinguished, there was little interest in the diseases of wild birds, and I cannot recollect having seen any suggestion that the passenger pigeon was subject to any affliction. I am perfectly content to accept the conclusion that the bird was killed off by man. In any case, we have no pamphlets on this bird published by the museum. Um, Glagroon, honestly, a lot of archival material tends to be correspondence because uh, for a lot of people, that's what they saved was letters back and forth. This is somewhat unusual in that it is um, I mean, it is an item of correspondence. It, it was bound and added to the library's collection at one point, which is why it had the checkout card slot and the call number on it. Um, but really, this is a single letter that is a summary of other correspondence, um, which would not really be that unusual to find in somebody's personal papers. Uh, so. What is unusual about this is that it is an, a single item by itself, and it's been described individually as a single item. It was bound and in the library collection on its own at one point. Um, that is relatively unusual. Usually something like this you would find in a folder of a bunch of letters from, or uh, more likely two, the person who donated their papers to the archives. Um, so it's not really unusual to have somebody's personal correspondence. It is unusual to have it kind of in this form, is, is how I would answer that question. Um, and honestly, if this had not been correspondence from the, a former head librarian here, we probably wouldn't have it, um, at least not in this form. So, but that's it. That's a great question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, the third item on here is a reply from A.C. Bent at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. I know no more about the passenger pigeon than was published in my bulletin 162, Life Histories of North American Gallicanaceous Birds, or Gallinaceous Birds. Uh, I have never heard of any publication on the diseases of this bird and doubt if any study of this subject was, has ever been made. 
The wholesome slaughter of these birds for many years was almost wholly responsible, or the whole sale slaughter of these birds for many years was almost wholly responsible for its disappearance. There may have been some disease or weakening from inbreeding which brought about the end. When a species is reduced to small numbers or when the sexes are out of balance, its end is inevitable. And let's see, the fourth one on this page is a reply from Dr. A. Wetmore, Secretary, Smithsonian Institution, Washington, D.C. In response to the carbon of your recent inquiry concerning the passenger pigeon, so far as I know, nothing has been published on disease in this bird since it became extinct before much attention was paid to these matters among our wild species. It is common belief among many who have known of this species that it must have perished from some disease since it has since it has seemed incredible that the vast hosts described by the early naturalists could have disappeared through any other means. However, I have looked into this matter with some attention, both through literature and through discussion with those who knew the bird in life. And I'm convinced that we owe its destruction solely to market hunting. The species congregated in vast groups for breeding so that it was easily accessible. It produced one egg for a setting. The occasional records that have been found of two eggs to a nest are without doubt due to two females laying together in the crowded rookeries that these birds frequented. Under this procedure, it would take two years to reproduce the original pair, allowing for no mortality. No species with this rate of reproduction can stand the pressure to which the passenger pigeon was subjected. If you are not familiar with the literature on the subject, you will find the following useful. W. B. Mershon, The Passenger Pigeon, uh, The Outing Publishing Company, New York, 1907, pages 1 through 125, illustrated. Charles Wendell Townsend, The Passenger Pigeon, in A.C. Bent, Life Histories of North American Gallinaceous Birds, U.S. Natural Museum, Bulletin 162, 1932, pages 379 to 402. In closing, let me say that my father has often told me of standing on a hill and shooting pigeons as they came out of their nesting rookeries. The supposition was that the hunters killed only males, but in point of fact, they shot everything that came along. If you will look up statistics on the hundreds of barrels of these birds that were shipped to the markets from these, rooks, from these roosts, I feel sure you will be forced to agree that it is man that has killed them. The species was one that was highly gregarious, with the big flocks broken up apparently, wait, sorry, with the big flocks broken up, apparently the birds could no longer maintain themselves. Here we come to influences that are difficult to explain. We find, however, similar situations in various other species where the reaction is well known. For example, the raven at an early date was widely spread through Eastern, Ameri through Eastern North America from the East Coast to the Great Lakes area in Ohio. Now it is entirely gone from this region, though I can see no reason for it not, to it, for it not having maintained itself as has its close relative, the crow. So even though this one starts off saying that it seems like disease, uh, they then go on to say, but then I researched it and it wasn't disease. Um, also, if anybody uh, is watching who is unfamiliar with the turn of phrase at the beginning of this, in, your res in response to the carbon of your recent inquiry, um, that would be referring to a technology that was in wide use in the mid-1940s, uh, the carbon copy. Uh, so essentially, a carbon copy, if you're not familiar, would be, um, it, it's a method of making a, an exact duplicate of something as you're creating the original. Uh, so as you're typing out a letter, you would take, um, the original piece of paper that the original is going to be on, and then you'd have a piece of 
carbon paper between, uh, which is paper that on one side, it's just like a really thin layer of paper, and on the other side, it's uh, black carbon. Um, and then you'd put the next piece of paper under that, and you could do multiple layers. Um, it would only go through so many, but you could do two or three carbons at a time, uh, and you'd run that into the typewriter together, and as you're hitting the keys, or um, if you're writing out a carbon or something, you could do that too. Uh, you're just pressing down with your pen or pencil. Um, as you make the mark on the top page, it presses into that sheet of carbon paper, which uh, implants the black carbon that's on the back side of it onto the next sheet of paper. So it's like typing the same thing on two pages at the same time. So, yeah, carbon paper like in checkbooks, Simsilica. <laughs> and key squared. It's a little, little surreal when the stream freezes, uh, when you get email alerts. They're mostly about ALA annual. <laughs> oh, key squared, that is funny. I was just looking at um, information about the Society of American Archivists convention, uh, checking on the date and when I need to think about registering to go. Um, but apparently it's virtual this year. They're doing just a virtual conference again this year. Uh, so the first week of August, I'll probably be watching a lot of conference sessions. Um, oh, cool, Glagroon. What, um, if you don't mind sharing, around what time period was that that you were using carbon paper in school to learn typewriting. Um, I, attended, I attended high school in the uh, mid-1990s, and uh, they still offered typing classes. Um, I've used carbon paper in my lifetime, but not often. Uh, in middle school, I took quizzes in my science class that were made with a mimeograph machine. Um, which is another method of running off multiple copies of something. Uh, but uh, carbon paper was not in regular use for me. Okay, you used it in the 90s, okay. And key squared, you used it in middle school in the late 80s. Yeah, I mean, that, that's roughly the same time period when I was in school and I also used carbon paper. Um, but we're on Twitch now, and I don't know. Uh, when I was looking at this, I was like, oh, 1945, you know, that's only like 50 years ago. And then I was, had to stop and think, and, no, that's 76 years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure there are people, uh, th there's at least the chance that there are people watching who have never heard of carbon paper. <laughs> um. Late 90, by late 90s, early 2000s, it was no longer in use, at least in your high school. Yeah, we didn't, um, I've encountered it. I want to say it was in middle school when I used it. Um, I don't remember it being used pretty much at all in late 90s. When I was in school. But it was still used for checks, so you could do carbon checks, um, which <laughs> checkbooks also aren't really used today, but you'd write out a check and it, you would have a thick piece of like cardboard that you'd put underneath it um, so that you were only writing on one, and you'd write on it, and when you tore it off there was like a, there was the carbon transfer on the back of it. Um, it was a much advanced version of carbon paper at that time, uh, so it wasn't like a sheet of paper that had black on the back of it. Um, it just looked like a sheet of paper. You could run your fingers across it and it didn't really do anything, but it was like a pressure sensitive sheet behind the first one so that when you wrote on it, what you were writing would transfer onto the second sheet. Um, yeah. Yeah, the 20th century doesn't seem that far away, but it was 21 years ago. Yeah. 
I mean, growing up, the 1950s was roughly 50 years ago for me. Um, I'm giving my age away. Also, Glickroon, thank you for the follow. I just noticed that. Um, but yeah, 1954, 45, 54, wh what was this? 45, 1945 was 76 years ago. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to read the next entry. <laughs> See, this, this, is, this is how I can make one item last two hours. Uh, reply from Mrs. Arthur A. Allen, Instructor in Ornithology, Laboratory of Ornithology, Cornell University, Ithaca, which would be New York. <laughs> was not worth it. <laughs> you, you don't have to share your age, but uh, that comment implies that you are older. Did this start with the particular typed paper? Um, I, I'm not sure what you're asking. If you're asking how we got on the topic of carbon paper, et cetera, uh, the last entry that we read in the correspondence about passenger pigeons started with a reference to, um, in it, it started off in response to in response to the carbon of your recent inquiry, and I wanted to make sure that anybody watching who didn't know what carbon paper was or what that reference was referring to um, understood what it was referring to. So that's how that conversation got started, if that's what you were asking. If not, <laughs> CCC and BCC, oh yeah, I absolutely get that reference. Um, but I also uh, was around at the, the birth of... Uh, the birth of the internet being available to the general consumer. Not the birth of the internet, but the birth of the internet being available to the general consumer. Oh, hi, Fluidan. <laughs> Welcome in. <laughs> I'm going to read the next entry. Keep chatting. Uh, I will check chat when I've finished the next entry. <coughs> Reply from Mrs. Arthur A. Allen, Instructor in Ornithology, Laboratory of Ornithology, Cornell University, Ithaca, which would be New York. Uh, your letter to Dr. Allen has come during his absence on an expedition for the War Department. It therefore falls to me to try to give you a reference on the passenger pigeon. Perhaps the best and most authoritative book on this bird is The Passenger Pigeon by W. B. Mershon. It is not new, having been published by the uh, Outing Publishing Company in 1907, but it represents a wealth of information on the life history and disappearance of this species. There is one chapter on what became of the wild pigeon by Sullivan Cook. This was first published in Forest and Stream, March 14, 1903. It is probable that the bird was ruthlessly killed in countless thousands until it was no longer abundant, and then after flocks became smaller and more widely scattered, the birds were gradually decimated by diseases, and also perhaps by the absence of synchronization in the breeding cycle when the birds became very scarce. In this way, although there may have been a considerable number left, they did not find mates in their proper stage of the cycle, and thus many eggs at the end of the passenger pigeon's career were infertile. This is, I think, the way Dr. Allen has interpreted the unsuccessful breeding attempts of ruffed grouse, and it would probably apply to other species. There may be other theories, but I think this one would hold to some extent. It is true also, as Mr. Hershon's book points out, that some flocks of birds were killed by storms. All right, and that was, that was that entry. Oh no, Glugroon, don't, that, that, that's cursed. Don't do that. Don't, don't bring up AOL CDs, really. You have no idea how many of them end up in boxes of personal papers that end up here at the archives and then we have to just we, we have to do what's necessary and dispose of the AOL CDs. 
<laughs> so many, so, so many. Um, they are definitely not something we need to be archiving here. <laughs> Even though we, we do have some collections that we're starting to get about the history of computing. Um, I do want to take a look at those soon. Maybe, maybe I'll look at those around September. They haven't been processed yet. Um, but we've got a couple that would be really interesting to look at. Uh, I'll have to see where they fit in the schedule. You microwaved a bunch of them and put feet on them to turn them into coasters. <laughs> oh my gosh. That couldn't have been good for your microwave, Key Squared. I'm trying to actually read um, names. Uh, hello, uh, Juventa Shaloni? Sh Juventa Shaloni? I'm not sure how to say your name. If you do want to provide pronunciation information for me in chat or give me a nickname that you want me to refer to you by, Juve. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I looked at it. I was like, I'm not certain. But. Um, <laughs> Christmas ornaments. Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, they did, they were ubiquitous. And so finding other uses for them was definitely a, a good way to reuse them uh, before it was time to recycle them. What's funny is, um, they, I mean, CDs were super, super cheap at that time. Um, you could buy a hundred CDs for like five bucks, ten bucks, uh, and they were all guaranteed to keep your data safe for a hundred years. But the actual, the actual lifespan of data on a CD um, is roughly ten to twenty years. So uh, while it is possible that you can still read them, um, the actual like guaranteed lifespan on CDs is ten to twenty years. Uh, and anything that was stored on CDs in the 90s is getting to that point where there's a good chance it's not going to be recoverable even if you have the drives to read the CD. Um, so I will just note, <laughs> if you have data on old CDs that you were relying on those CDs to keep that data safe, it's probably time to look at a different storage medium. Um, I'm going to read, we have, it looks like just one more entry in the correspondence. So I'm going to read that. Um, and then we will start looking at uh, some of the other bird items that I brought because um, this being a short or a small collection, um, it, it apparently is not going to fill the entire two hours. but. Uh, the last one in here is a reply from Dr. J.J. Murray, Lexington, Virginia. I do not know of any literature which would give you information as to diseases among passenger pigeons. The best references I can give you on the passenger pigeon are the following in each, in each of which causes for the disappearance of the species are discussed. Life Histories of North American Gallinaceous Birds by A.C. Bent, U.S. National Museum, Bulletin 162, pages 379 to 402. Birds of Massachusetts by E.F. Forbush, Volume 2, pages 54 to 82. And Bird Lore, Magazine, 1913, March to April, pages 77 to 103. The first two of these are almost certainly in the VPI library. Mr. Handley also has copies of them. All of these writers agree that reckless slaughter was the cause of the bird's, bird's disappearance. Dr. Frank Chapman, Handbook of Birds of Eastern North America, closes his discussion with this statement, man and man alone is responsible for the passenger pigeon's extermination. From his first contact with it in the Atlantic states to the date of its disappearance, he was its merciless destroyer. Other factors, of course, had a part in keeping down the numbers of the bird, but these factors had always been present and were, uh, were minor factors. So far as I know, there are no grounds for thinking that disease played any great part. 
there may be some late evidence of which I am ignorant. Ooh, you read from A.C. Bent? Um, I am unfamiliar, but apparently A.C. Bent uh, put out a bulletin on the life histories of North American gallinaceous birds. Oh, yes. Oh, gosh. I thought you were saying that in, in your own personal research or something, you, you referred to A.C. Bent. But yes, yes, there was a letter in here from A.C. Bent. Um, and in fact, uh, oh, where was it? Yeah, so the third one that we read was from A.C. Bent. There was also one in here that I noted as I was reading it. Oh, it's, I think it's this one, Dr. A. Wetmore. Yeah, Dr. A. Wetmore also referred to uh, Charles Wendell Townsend's The Passenger Pigeon in A.C. Bent's uh, Bulletin 162. And one second. Ooh. Oh, he has a Wikipedia entry. <clears throat> Hopefully, <clears throat> I didn't have time to, I didn't have to time to find the mute button, so I just took off the microphone and tried to hold it away from my sneeze. Hopefully the sneeze was not too loud for you. <laughs> um, let me see if I can grab that Wikipedia article and drop it in the chat. Uh, also, I can just read it. Arthur Cleveland Bent. Actually, I'm just going to bring it up and show it on screen because I don't have a problem reading you a Wikipedia article. <laughs> Good, Glagreen. Thank you for that. I was like, oh. Usually they come on and I've got plenty of time and I know like my sneezes aren't usually like as urgent as that one was. Um, <laughs> and so I've actually showed you the, the actual book. I, we'll look at the Wikipedia article first and then I will say what I was going to say there. Arthur Cleveland Bent, born November 25th, 1866 and d died December 30th, 1954 was an American ornithologist, notable for his encyclopedic 21-volume work, Life Histories of North American Birds, um, published starting in 1919 and through 1968, and completed posthumously. He started contributing papers to the AUK in 1901. The AUK um, is the Journal of the American Ornithologists' Union, um, which is also incidentally named for another extinct bird. Uh, so apparently at re the request of the Smithsonian Institution in 1910, he started working on the life histories of Native American, or of North American birds. And that is amazing. Like, a couple of them have actual entries of their own. Oh, that links out to the Hadi, Hadi Trust, which just means they're scanned copies. So, possible to actually see. How do you trust us? Um, good for information access, especially last year when all of the libraries closed. The Hadi Trust was very useful for information access. <laughs> Hannah, you just finished putting together a bookshelf. Uh, 
I will agree that does seem a very appropriate thing to have been doing during this stream. First few volumes of his life histories of birds are old enough to be in the public domain, and they're on Gutenberg. Um, <coughs> so what I was almost distracted into saying was, I showed you all the actual like bound item that used to be part of the main library's collection, <coughs> and then became part of special collections. And rather than being in our rare books collection, it was processed as a manuscript collection, and I wasn't certain why, but I think my guess would be it has to do with the fragility of the papers in here. Or just that we decided that it should be a manuscript collection rather than a rare book, because it's not technically a book. Um, but where the pages bend in here, most of them have cracked, and some of them almost all the way down. So turning these pages, um, like this first page where you can see there's a, there's a chunk of the page missing. You can kind of see how it's got like a bite out of it. Um, there's also half of that page is like the page is separated at the fold halfway down. Um, so they're very, very delicate pages. And so for actual like research use, for researchers who r would want to consult this and use it, we actually have photocopies of everything in the collection just in the folder here. So we have the original, which is what I showed off on stream today, but we also have photocopies of everything um, that if somebody wants to take a copy, uh, they can use these on the copy machine to get a copy of the item. Um, and they can look at them and get the informational content without damaging or risking, the, uh, risking damage to the original item. Um, so I brought a couple I bought, I brought everything back from last week. Um, so if there was something last week that you really liked and you want to take another look at, I have everything from last week, just let me know. Um, and I grabbed a couple of additional items. Document focus. There we go. First, I want to revisit the great auk. This was the last item that we were looking at last week, and it was focused on another extinct bird, the great auk. Um, if I can turn the pages, one second. <coughs> the great auk, or garafowl, garafowl, I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, G-A-R-E-F-O-W-L. So this book, um, is just titled The Great Auk, or Garfowl, Its History, Archaeology, and Remains, by Symington Grieve, Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Um, and the image here, the image on this page, is an engraved figure of a stuffed specimen of the Great Auk in the Central Park Museum, New York. Oh, I've cut off its head. Uh, so this was published in 1885. Um, and I think I read part of the preface last time talking about um, this person who put this together. Um, talked about how they're not an actual ornithologist. They're not uh, heavily... Like, they're, they're not working as a scientist to study this, but they've been gathering information about it and wanted to just put it out so that other people would have access to all of the information they had gathered. Um, which is an interesting kind of self-deprecating introduction about how they don't feel like they're worthy to be writing this work, but 
they're the one that has the material. Um, and so essentially, late 1800s, this bird was already gone. Uh, and the author is gathering together reports of people's encounters with it to try and understand the great auk, which essentially from the images that are here seems like it was mostly a type of penguin, maybe? I mean, I don't think it's actually related to a penguin, but it was a seabird of that type. Um, so here at chapter five, we have the remains of the Garefowl in Denmark and Iceland. Uh, having now treated of the American locality, we shall turn to the European region and endeavor to give a short account of the remains that have been discovered there, or been there discovered. We believe it is to Professor Steenstrup of Copenhagen that the credit attaches of having identified the first bones of the Garifowl known to have been found in Europe, which were discovered at Malgard in Jutland, uh, as we are not aware that any of his papers have, have been even partially published in English, we have obtained the permission of Professor, Professor Steenstrup to give some translations of parts of them kindly furnished us by a friend. The first extract we give is this beginning of what may be considered the most valuable paper that has been written on the great auk, and it was the discovery of the first bones of the uh, Alea Impenis L, found in Denmark, that led Professor Steenstrup to study the history of the bird. He says, In the investigation of the kitchen midden of the primeval people, oversight over Weidenskab, uh, Selskab's Forhandlinger, 1855, uh, among other remains were found some traces of two of the larger birds not now found here viz. the Capercalii, and of a larger bird of the Auk tribe, which must be regarded as, as the as good as extirpated Garifowl. Since the last named bird was n has not been found in the last few decenniums, no, not even this century, breeding upon any place farther south than the Garifowl rocks that lie some few miles from the south coast of Iceland, and since the further appearance of scattered specimens driven towards the north or western coasts of Europe belong to the class of the greatest rarities, the proof of the existence of many specimens of the Garfowl in this heap must naturally be very surprising. <clears throat> since that must indicate that this bird was three or four thousand years ago found down the Katakat. The more unexpected this discovery was, the more important was it for me to be able to place beyond doubt the explanation of the discovered bones. This was all the more difficult as no skeleton of this rare bird existed either in our own museum or so far as is known in any other museums. But as I, on the one hand, found perfect agreement between the discovered bones and the corresponding bones of all the lesser European birds of the Auk tribe, and on the other hand found certain peculiarities that distinguished the former, for, the former from the latter, I could scarcely go wrong in declaring the bird to which the bones belonged to be, in the first place, a bird of the Auk tribe, in the second place, an Auk of the size of a goose, and lastly, an Auk in the highest degree fitted for swimming and diving, but utterly unsuited for flight a state of matters only applying among all known species of this family to the Alia Impenis of Linnaeus. In this opinion, I was quite confirmed by a remarkable combination of circumstances. Among a little circle of Scandinavian naturalists, it was known that the Norwegian naturalist P. Stuvitz, whom his government had sent out on account of the fisheries to Newfoundland and the adjacent parts of the North America continent, had sent home some bones of birds from a little island off the coast either of Labrador or Newfoundland. These bones were found in large heaps on the shore, and after their arrival in this country, they were declared to be the bones of the Garfowl. This could be asserted of them all the more certainly as 
uh, there were found among them, in addition to all the essential bones of the skeleton, a not inconsiderable number of crania. And these crania agreed in every respect with those which one had from the few stuffed specimens. Some of these bones sent by Stuvitz had luckily been presented to the Zo Zootomical Museum of the university, and moreover, some of them belonged to the same parts of the skeleton as the bones now under discussion that had been found in the primitive kitchen middens. <laughs> Whew. Yes, so it's so like a northern hemisphere iceberg of unusual size. It sounds like uh, roughly the size of a goose. Um, and so, yeah, this isn't, I, I'm very interested in this book. I'm gonna have to just like read it at my desk or something uh, because I find it fascinating. Um, ooh, there is a color figure in this book. The egg of the great auk or garfowl, preserved in the Natural History Collection, Museum of Science and Art, Edinburgh. Um, but yeah, so uh, being the size of a goose, being adapted for sea rather than air, um, to me it just sounds like a northern hemisphere penguin. Uh, but I would need to research more. I've not done a lot of research on penguins themselves, so I don't know if they are in, I don't know what family they're in, whether they would be related to the great auk or not. I would, I would need to check that, because like I said, I don't know. Uh, most of my knowledge of birds is focused on the birds that are the type typically um, kept as pets. So the Cytisci family, um, particularly cockatiels, uh, parakeets, um, etc. Those are the birds that I know the most about. Um, this appears to be a range map. It's a fold-out map uh, chart showing the supposed distribution of the great auk or gray garfowl. Um, mostly North Atlantic encompassing Iceland and Greenland, coast of Labrador, uh, the coast of Sweden. I don't I don't know that it was art. It may have actually been a photograph. Um, I can't open this map all the way. Down to France, northern coast of Spain, and down to around Boston. Um, I'll see, I'll, I'll find those eggs again and we can take a look. Yeah, I'm not sure. It doesn't say. Um, this book was from 1880, the 1880s. So it's possible that it is actually a photograph um, rather than an illustration. Um, it's a somewhat glossy page. I don't know. If it's an illustration, it's absolutely amazing. Um, it doesn't tell me who made the art. There's no information in here about the actual art itself. I'll check the front and see if in the front matter it gives credits for the illustration. <laughs> Interesting. It's this was put out by Ballantine Press, which is a name that is familiar. Um, illustrations, X I. Ooh, there are more illustrations. Uh, so, the eggs, colored plates of each of the two great auk eggs in the Museum of Science and Art, Edinburgh. 
exact drawings from nature, specially prepared for this work. These eggs are now figured for the first time. So they are not photographs, they are drawings. <laughs> You've got a good eye. Like, it's very detailed. It, it could easily have been photographs from all that I knew. Um, let's see, what other... Engraving of a portion of bone, engraving, view of the shell mound, 49. It's just an illustration of a hill. <laughs> Sixty-eight. I'm just looking for other other pictures in here. Um, the egg ones are the most striking. Ooh. Here's another drawing of a great auk, the gare fowl. Uh, Anser Magellanicus, soy seu penguini of Alaus Wormius from Federal, 1655, Great Auk, Alca Impenis, Linnaeus, facsimile of original figure reduced in size by one third. So just a drawing of what a Great Auk looked like. And uh, based on this, I do believe that it is likely related to penguins. Um, I would assume not as well, because this is um, B-A-L-L-Y. Uh, oh, B-A-L-L-A-N-T-Y-N-E Press. Ballantyne Hanson and Company, Edinburgh and London. So, yeah, probably not the same one, but I was like, I know the name Ballantyne, but you're right, it's probably not the same. Um, so I grabbed a couple of new items that I didn't have with me last week on the chance that, uh, on the chance that we were not going to take up all of the time with what we were originally looking at. So this one, uh, it's, this is the item, if somebody was to come in and use it, this is what we would use. It's got the barcode on it to scan. Um, you, as you can see, it's somebody's written History of Birds, which is the title, and Fragile. And inside that is an insert that is just like a piece of folder. Um, and inside that is where the book was. The History of Birds. I have not looked at this item before. Um, it is not new. You can see there is a very faint illustration on the front. Um, there appears to be two people on a horse, but that's about all I can make out from the illustration. The date at the bottom appears to be 1624. I will double check our library catalog and confirm. Item type. The history of birds. Just waiting for the catalog. The history of birds. Oh, apparently 1824. It does look like a 16, but 
according to our catalog, it is 1824, not 1624. So 200 years newer than I thought it was based on looking at that. Um, so the book itself, you can see there's some string here at the edge, um, which is the binding um, that's holding it together. There's another illustration on the back which just seems to be a guy in a drawing room, uh, maybe a lady in a chair next to him under a painting of some flowers. I don't see any birds in the illustrations on the cover. Um, yes, 1824. The History of Birds, Sydney's Press, New Haven, 1824. Uh, we have an, a figure of a golden eagle. Yeah, a very 1800-ish drawing room. <laughs> At least there are illustrations of birds on the interior of the item, rather than, like, the covers didn't have any birds on them. Um, and uh, the, the main title page, that appears to be a peacock. So the Golden Eagle, last week we did definitely have uh, an item where the person argued that the Golden Eagle and not the Bald Eagle should have been the uh, American national bird. Um, they were not fond of the Bald Eagle at all, but thought that the Golden Eagle was pretty, co pretty cool. Um, you live near a town by the name of Audubon named after John Audubon, but in typical, not pronounced like the name. Yeah, um, oh shoot, what does, I can't think of how that is pronounced in Iowa, the, the town name. It's been a while since I was there. I don't remember. Turkeys? What about turkeys, Lord Portico? I don't see any turkeys. Audubon. Yeah, I, I just know that when I lived in Iowa, I was in eastern Iowa, and um, I was not far from the town of Ely, or Eli, and I can't remember now which way it's pronounced in Iowa, because I think my brain said, oh, that's Eli, um, and yeah, so my brain said, oh, you know, that's Eli. It's E-L-Y. It's Eli. Um, and in Iowa, it was Ely. Um, and in Minnesota, it was Ely, too. Uh, I didn't understand that. National bird. Yeah, turkeys. Turkeys Turkeys are mean. <laughs> you saw a turkey, but it was in your sandwich. That's, that's good. Um, so we have, uh, this was published by J. Babcock and Son, New Haven, and S. Babcock and Company, Charleston, South Carolina, who keep constantly for sale a good assortment of books and stationery. Um, I would imagine that they probably do no longer keep constantly for sale a good assortment of books and stationery. But if anybody wants to check on the Babcock and Son uh, company in New Haven and Charleston, South Carolina, and let me know if they're still in operation distributing books, I would be very interested. Madrid and Nevada are two other Iowa towns that are not pronounced the way that they should be. Um. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of them. And, and for anybody who can't see that chat, um, if anybody on the other channel is curious, uh, Madrid, Iowa is pronounced Madrid, but is spelled Madrid, and Nevada, Iowa is pronounced Nevada, but is spelled Nevada. Uh. <laughs> Unless they've moved into locksmithing, they appear not to be in operation anymore. Thank you, Lord Portico. Um, the history of birds. The Golden Eagle, which is one of the largest of this noble family, is about three feet in length, and the extent of its wings is seven feet, four inches. 
The head and neck are clothed with narrow pointed feathers of a deep brown color bordered with tawny. The whole body also is of a dark brown, the black being finely clouded with a deeper shade of the same. The tail is brown, irregularly barred with an obscure ash color. The beak is of a deep blue and the eye of a hazel color. The legs are yellow, strong, and feathered to the very feet, and the toes are armed with formidable claws. This fierce animal may be considered among birds as the lion among the quadrupeds. And in many respects, they exhibit a strong similitude. Equally magnanimous, they condemn petty plunder and only pursue animals worthy of their conquest. The eagle also disdains to share the plunder of another bird, and whatever may be the calls of hunger, he never stoops to carry him, but leaves it for other animals more rapacious and less delicate than himself. Nor does the similitude of these creatures stop here. They have both sparkling eyes and nearly of the same color. Their claws are of the same form, their breath equally strong, and their cry alike vociferous and terrifying. The nest of this bird is usually built in the most inaccessible cliff of a rock and generally shielded from the weather by some jutting crag that hangs over it. The period of incubation is said to be 30 days and when the young are hatched, both the male and female exert all their industry to provide for their wants. In the rear of this terrible bird might be considered the ring-tailed eagle, common eagle, bald eagle, rough-footed eagle, uh, Ernie and Black Eagle. But though these and others that might be enumerated form different shades in this fierce family, they have all the same rapacity, the same general form, the same habits, and the same manner of bringing up their young. <laughs> Surprisingly distant from Berlin, Ohio which rhymes with Perlin. Yeah, Portico, I agree. This is a very editorial take on the Golden Eagle. Um, I'm, based on this, my, my reaction would be, I'm very curious to find out if there's ever been a scientific study of the similarities between a Golden Eagle and a lion. Because Apparently, they have the same claws and the same cry, and they both have the same strong breath uh, and the same sparkling eyes, and that they're the same color. So, the only difference between a lion and a golden eagle is that one has wings and a beak, according to this. <laughs> Uh, I think the author of this item, as with the author of the one that we looked at last week, really liked the Golden Eagle. The owl. One has pride, the other flocks around. <laughs> All birds of the owl kind may be considered as nocturnal robbers, who, unfitted for taking their prey while it is light, Surprise it at those hours of rest when the tribes of nature are least in expectation of an enemy. It is not, however, as some have imagined in the darkest nights, but in the dusk of evening or dawn of morning that they are best fitted for seeing. It is then they come abroad in quest of plunder, and they carefully return to their retreats before the broad daylight begins to dazzle them with, the, with its splendor. The larger animals of this tribe are called horned owls, from the circumstance of two or three feathers standing up on each side of the head over the ear and resembling horns. One variety of these appears at first sight as large as an eagle, but on a closer inspection he will be found considerably less. His plumage is of a reddish brown, diversified with black and yellow spots. <laughs> I want to know how this author came to be smelling the breath of a lion and lived to complain about it later. Same! I want to know how this author lived, lived to tell the tale of smelling the breath of a golden eagle, too. 
<laughs> Kira. Comparison chart that has several claws, both eagle and animal. An African lion claw and a golden eagle claw are nothing alike. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah, I... Also, like, this author clearly does not like owls. Considered as nocturnal robbers, unfitted for taking their prey while it is light. <gasps> the turkey. Let's see what this author thinks of the turkey. The turkey, when young, is generally considered as one of the tenderest of birds. Yet in its wild state, it is found in great plenty in the forests of Canada, which are covered with snow above three parts of the year. It is there also much larger than in a state of captivity, and its feathers are much more beautiful, being of a dark gray, bordered at the edges with a bright gold color. The hunting of these animals forms one of the principal diversions of the native, of the native, I'm going to say of the native people, but that is not what it says in the book. You can see on screen what it actually says. Uh, as their flesh contributes to the support of his family. Having discovered, their having discovered their retreat, he sends his dog into the midst of, midst of the flock, and though the turkeys soon outstrip their pursuers by running, he continues to follow till he at last forces them to take shelter in a tree, whence they are knocked down by a long pole and easily taken. Apparently, no opinion on turkeys other than that when they're young, they're tender, and how they're hunted. <laughs> Bottled lion breath. Yes, the tenderest of burbs. Um, turkeys are mean. They will attack and they won't let up. If, if they target you, they're gonna come at you. You will not be able to get out of your car. If they come after you and you're in your car, they, they will attack. They will stand there and wait for you to get out so they can keep attacking. You will have to call the police. <laughs> not a description for the turkeys you have in Iowa, at least not the wild ones. Yeah, I was like, what? Like. Glowing, glowing report of the Golden Eagle, followed by a teardown of the owl. And the turkey is just, hmm, when they're young, they're pretty tender, and they make good hunting. <laughs> Proper hokey tradition. Um, so the origins of why the turkey was the original mascot of Virginia Tech and then why we have the Hokey Bird now? Lost to time, we don't really know. Um, but Virginia Tech actually a couple of times has housed the turkeys that are pardoned by the president on Thanksgiving Day. Um, there are always two turkeys. Um, one that is pardoned in the ceremony, but they both get to go off to a farm and live and not become dinner. Um, and so a number of times those turkeys have come here. Um, I think the barn that they're kept in is called Turkey's Rest. I don't remember. Um, turkeys only live for about a year, year and a half. They, they don't live that long, um, at least not after they've been fattened up uh, in a farm life. So typically the ones that are being pardoned um, for that show, they only live for a year or two after, after that. Um, so they've come to, to be housed here a couple of times, but um, Virginia Tech had a reputation or has, has, uh, was heavily involved in the creation of the American turkey industry, uh, the development of turkey breeding and sale of turkey meat and like the, the industry around turkeys in the United States, um, Virginia Tech was heavily involved in the development of that industry. 
<laughs> Bottled lion's breath imbues, imbues with courage and a tendency to take mid-afternoon naps. Let's see what else we have. Uh, the pheasant. Another bird well known for having been eaten quite a lot. Let's see what this author has to say. Nothing indeed can charm the eye with a greater richness and variety of ornament than this beautiful bird. The iris of the eye is yellow and the eyes themselves are surrounded by a scarlet color sprinkled with specks of black. The top of the head and upper part of the neck are tinged with a darkish green which shines like silk and sometimes appears to change to blue as it is differently presented to the eye of the spectator. The plumage on the breast, the shoulders, the middle of the back, and the sides under the wings have a blackish ground, have a blackish ground, with edges tinged with an exquisite purple, and under this is a transverse streak of gold color. The length of the tail from the middle feathers to the root is about 18 inches. The plumage of the female, however, is inferior to that of the male. In, in the woods, the female lays from 18 to 20 eggs in a season, but in a domestic state, she seldom produces above 10. Uh, yes, so we might say the, the, the pheasant is pleasant. Um, interesting, uh, so yes, pheasant, another bird that, um, especially in the 1800s, would have been a popular eating bird. But unlike the turkey, he has actual commentary on the looks of the pheasant uh, instead of just talking about how it's hunted and that it's good to eat. Um, reading this description, I'm like, this is a lot of detail on how a pheasant looks. I feel like if I, if I had like a, a tabletop gaming miniature of a pheasant, I would have very specific instructions on how to paint it by reading this description. <laughs> oh no, more recipe talk? Yes, please. Um, and I will note, for anybody who's watching on VTUL Studios and you're, you're confused about who I'm responding to, I am live on two channels. I'm live on VTUL Studios and on Rogan27. Um, and the Rogan27 chat is just pretty active. If you do have questions on the VTUL Studios channel or commentary, um, feel free to drop it in the chat and I'm happy to answer questions or interact with uh, you as well. Um, I just, most of the chat is happening over here and so you're hearing me comment on that. Um, I feel this 1800s children's book was not checked for the author's bias towards certain birds. Indeed, Simsilica, indeed. I'm not even sure we have, we don't have an author's name either. Like, there's no information about who this is. It's just Sydney's Press, New Haven. I'm going to end up reading the whole thing. It's from the 1800s, and the entries are quite interesting, even if they are not giving us any sort of a history of birds. Was it birds? Yes, yes, Kira, birds. Uh, the sparrow. How will he malign the sparrow? Let's find out. The sparrow is one of the most familiar of volatiles, cons constantly fluttering round our habitations and seldom absent from our orchards and gardens. It is universally hated by farmers as injurious to their rural economy, yet its utility has been clearly proved to overbalance its depredations, for it has been known that a single pair of sparrows during the time they have to feed their young destroy on an average every week between 30 and 40,000 caterpillars, besides a variety of winged insects. These birds generally build their nests under the caves of houses, under the eaves of houses, or in holes in the walls, and the Affection of the female toward her young is equally strong and interesting. Oh, birds. <laughs> it was written by birds. <laughs> Perhaps they wrote it, but don't want us to know. Hence the bias. Oh, no. No, Kira, no. No, no aspic. You're going to put that link in the other chat too, right? Why is it always aspic? 
Have you had aspic? I've had duck in aspic, and aspic is not worth it. Just really, really not worth it. I have to click on the link now, though. Pheasants a la daub. Roast two pheasants in the nicest manner. Get a deep dish the size and form of the one you intend to serve the pheasants in. It must be as deep as a tureen. Put in savory jelly about an inch and a half at the bottom. No. When that is set and the pheasants cold, lay them on the jelly with their breasts down. Fill the dish with jelly up to their backs. Take care it is not warm enough to melt the other and that the birds are not displaced. Just before it is to be served, set it a moment in hot water to loosen it. Put the dish on the top and turn it out carefully. Also, if you're serving bird in aspic, it's served cold. Who wants to eat meat-flavored jello and bird flesh cold? Not me. <laughs> 1820s, um, which is when this is from, 1824. So th that would have been a recipe from the time period that this book is from. Also, uh, so he seems to talk, uh, seems to think that sparrows are somewhat of a nuisance, but that they're the annoyance caused by them is outweighed by the number of caterpillars and flying insects that they eat. I will say to his sparrows are nuisances, uh, have you heard of starlings? Because I have, and starlings are worse. Especially when they flock together. Um, the titmouse, which is also called the tom tit, is about four inches and a half in length and has the straight black bill, has a straight black bill about half an inch long, pretty thick. The upper part of the head and chin are black with a spot of white beginning at the base of the bill and passing under the eyes to the sides of the neck, which color descends as low as the shoulders and middle part of the back where it appears more shaded with a glossy green. The rump is of fine blue. The quill feathers have some of the tips white, some blue, others green. The covered feathers by their white tips make a small transverse white line upon each wing. The breast, belly, and thighs are yellow with a broad black line passing from the throat down the middle of the breast to the vent. The tail is about two inches and a half long of a black color except the outward edges of some of the feathers which are blue. So apparently no opinions on the titmouse, uh, just a fairly detailed description of how they look, although I'm not sure exactly what is meant by the chin of a bird. I don't recall my birds having chins, just beaks. Uh, had he heard of starlings? How widespread were they by then? Weren't released here en masse until the late 1800s. Still a minor English songbird he might have read about in Shakespeare. I mean, I didn't really know about starlings until, um, honestly, I'm going it, to, it's going to be very nerdy. Um, there is a scene in one of the Marvel movies, I think it was one of the Marvel movies, of, the, of starlings flocking together through dimensional portals um, and I was like I had to find out more about those birds that were in that scene and learned more about starlings and then discovered the birds that have been nesting in the tree outside my apartment and um, spending a lot of time on my deck at my apartment and that just make a non-stop chittering noise are also starlings I don't mind, because I don't mind the noises that the birds make, but it's like a constant chittering, especially this time of year. Um, but yeah, starlings, starlings do a lot of damage. They, they can strip a tree bare. Um, 
just from spending time on it and, and their natural behaviors. Um, and they tend to move in big flocks. And so, um, yeah, but that's interesting that they, this book uh, being from New Haven, which would be Connecticut, um, the author probably wasn't familiar with starlings. The wild, or sorry, the wood grouse. Uh, today we would spell grouse with an E on the end. Uh, this bird what is nearly the size of a turkey and often weighs 12 or 14 pounds, but the female is considerably larger. The head and neck are ash-colored and crossed with black lines. The body and wings of a chestnut brown and the breast of a blackish glossy green. The plumage of the female is very dif different. This bird is chiefly found in mountainous and wooded situations, though in summer he occasionally ventures from his retreats to make short depredations on the farmer's corn. When in the recesses of the forest he attaches himself principally to the oak and the pine tree, the cones of the latter serving him for food, and the branches affording him ha a habitation. He also feeds upon cranberries, ants' eggs, and insects, and his gizzard, like that of domestic fowls, contains a quantity of gravel, which is supposed to assist his powers of digestion. The female generally chooses a dry place and a mossy ground for the purpose of incubation. She lays six or seven eggs, which are white, marked with yellow. Um, no, Hannah. The author does not describe what the female of the species looks like and hasn't in any of these. Um, apparently she's very different. So imagine the opposite of that. Yeah, I mean, I understand describing, especially for like a entertainment or commercial type market, I understand focusing on the male of the species for birds because the male of the species is the one that has the pretty plumage. Uh, but if you're describing the birds, you should describe both sexes so that people know. I mean, um, if I was describing a blue jay to, for people who wanted to know about blue jays, yeah, absolutely. I would talk about how the blue jay, the male blue jay uh, can have feathers that go from like a um, sort of washed out grayish color to a bright cobalt blue. Um, I would also let them know that their feathers are only blue during summer because during winter they have gray feathers. Uh, and I would also let them know the differences between the male and the female of the species. Like, I don't understand why you wouldn't tell them. Uh, so like with cockatiels, which is the bird that I am the most familiar with, having had cockatiels as pets in the past, uh, the males are the ones that have the orange and yellow patches on their cheeks. Um, the, and they end up with little bits of yellow that will creep into their plumage. Uh, the females tend to be more of a matte gray color. Um, they will end up with the orange patch, but not the yellow. Uh, and so the differences between the sexes, and, and it, even then it depends on which type of cockatiel you're looking at, because if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at the standard coloration, it's easy to tell male from female, but if you're looking at some of the things that breeders have developed because they were more prized, like a Lutino cockatiel, you're probably not going to be able to tell the difference because they've been bred to have more of the yellow colors. Uh, but yeah, the target audience was not worth it. Um, is probably more kids than ornithologists in this case. And the kids are going to be interested in the males of the species because they're the ones that have the pretty plumage. Um, and yeah, I, there are a couple things that let us know that it's probably for kids. Um, 
I would actually venture to say that the fact that there's no author given is, is one of those things. Uh, but the size of the book, this is definitely a small size meant to be able to go in somebody's pocket. Um, the way that the entries are written also comes across as mostly for kids. Um, woodpecker. I mean, this is like a kid's field guide to birds. I don't know why it's called the history of birds. It hasn't given me any history. Uh, of this bird, there are many kinds and several varieties in each kind. But instead of descending into a minute discrimination of every species, we shall take one for a pattern to which, to which all others bear the strongest affinity. Words can but feebly describe the plumage of a bird, but Pardon me, it is, uh, pardon me, I need a sip of water. <clears throat> Words can but feebly describe the plumage of a bird, but it is the province of history to mark every animal's pursuits and occupation. The green woodpecker is about the size of the jay. The throat, breast, and belly are of a greenish color, and the back, neck, and covert feathers of the wings are green, but the tongue is its most distinguished characteristic, as it serves both for its support and defense. This is round, ending on a sharp bony tip. Did I skip something? But the tongue is its most distinguished characteristic, as it serves for both its support and defense. This is round, ending on a sharp bony tip, uh, dentated on both sides like the beard of an arrow and capable of being thrust out three or four inches from the bill and drawn in again at pleasure. I agree, Hannah. Of all the woodpeckers, this isn't the one I would have picked to put in a kid's book. I don't know. Unnamed staff writer. Probably wrote something totally different the week before and after. Probably spent several hours researching birds. I've... I know I haven't seen a green woodpecker. <laughs> this is a really interesting book. I'm very curious. Um, Portico, if you're still there and happen to feel like searching, or anybody, if you're interested, see what you can find on Sydney's Press, New Haven, in the uh, early to mid 1800s. It's Sydney's S I D N E Y apostrophe S. Water oozel? O-U-Z-E-L. This is one I have not heard of before. Oh, oh dear, more coming. There's not mention of the red on the head of the woodpecker. You just looked up the green woodpecker and they have red on their head. <laughs> so not, not fully accurate, this book, either. It is really interesting, though, and the drawings of the birds are, are decent. <coughs> the water oozel. Uh, called also the water rail. Okay, I've heard of rails. I've not heard of oozles. Uh, is in size somewhat less than a blackbird. Its bill is black and almost straight. The eyelids are white. The upper parts of the head and neck are of a deep brown, and the rest of the upper parts, the belly, vent, and tail, are black. The chin, the forepart of the neck, the breast, and breast are white or yellowish. The legs are black. Not in the illustration, they're not. Uh, this bird frequents the banks of springs or brooks, which it never leaves, preferring the limpid streams whose fall is rapid and whose bed is broken with stones and rocks. The habits of this bird are very singular. Aquatic birds with palmated feet swim or dive. Those who inhabit the shores without wetting their body wade with their tall legs. But the water oozel walks quite into the flood, fall 
following the declivity of the ground. It is observed to enter by degrees till the water reaches its neck and is still Oh. It is observed to enter by degrees till the water reaches its neck, and it still advances, holding its head not higher than usual, though completely immersed. It continues to walk under the water and even descending to the bottom, where it saunters as on dry land. Yeah. Yeah, Hannah. I had the same thought. Um, they give... It's... Size is somewhat less than a blackbird. What if you don't know how big a blackbird is? They don't describe a blackbird in here. They don't give any measurements. So it's not useful to tell me that it's slightly less than a blackbird in size. That's not a useful... At least with the... the um, which one was it? The... The wood grouse, they used a reference of a turkey, and they had done some description of a turkey in the book. It's very interesting to me that he, he claims that the water oozel walks into the water and will just keep walking, making no change in the height of its head as it gets deeper and deeper. It'll just walk into the water and just keep walking on the bottom as though it was on land. No information about how long it will stay underwater or what enables it to spend time underwater without needing to access the air. I imagine it probably does not stay down there forever. Uh, I feel like more information is needed. <laughs> I think that's the end of this book. It is. I had not encountered this item from our collections before. I had a, an amazing time reading the history of birds with you all. I'm going to switch to my face, uh, because... We have reached the ending time for the stream. Thank you all for coming and listening to me read uh, a summary of someone's mail from 1945 about the causes for the extinction of the passenger pigeon. Uh, thank you also for going on an adventure with me with this History of Birds book that was quite entertaining in its evaluation of various birds. Um, I had a really good time with it today. Uh, more commonly called an American Dipper, about six and a half inches long. <laughs> he squared, I'm glad that you enjoy uh, diving into the archives with me. Um, next week, what do I have next week? I have forgotten. Um, one moment and I will tell you what we're looking at next week. Um, just have to pull up the spreadsheet. I haven't pulled the items yet, which is why I don't remember what we're looking at. Uh, I will be pulling them tomorrow. Uh, but next week we do have more birds um, because all of June we are doing birds. Next week, we're looking at the John Murray Papers. Um, I'm just going to look those up because I don't remember what about them makes them bird related. MS 2008036. The John Murray Papers document the participation of John Murray, a Virginia Tech chemistry professor from 1942 to 1971, in Virginia's ornithological community. Collected materials include manuscript articles, scholarly correspondence, and birdwatching logs, which focus largely on Montgomery County, Virginia. 
Uh, so a chemistry professor who was an amateur ornithologist. Uh, Will will have his papers next week. I will still have the selection of rare books. Um, I had at least three more that I had pulled as backup for today. We will have them as backup for next week as well. Uh, so that hopefully we can look at some more um, illustrations of birds. Uh, if we want to toward the end of stream, um, if we're if we get through, I don't know how big this collection is. I just had marked it and said, sure, I'll pull that and we'll take a look. Um, so two more weeks of birds, and then we're looking at um, the tradition of American backyard barbecuing, uh, barbecuing, uh, possibly looking at tailgating a little bit too. Uh, so that's what we'll do in July. Um, but thank you everybody for coming in today. It's been a lot of fun for me, and I've really been enjoying doing these streams. Um, these last six months. Um, we are going to be raiding the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It does look like they have the jelly cam up today. Um, yeah, it is the jelly cam. So if you uh, do not like jellyfish, <laughs> you don't have to stick around for the raid. But if you um, want to show some support for a wonderful organization um, that does a lot of work for aquatic life and education about aquatic life. Uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has some really chill streams. They literally just have a camera on something uh, at the aquarium and it makes a good background for getting stuff done. So join us for a raid over to the aquarium and um, yeah, that's what we're doing. I will see you all next week for more birds and thanks for stopping by.